Hello everyone, welcome to the Eureka Centre and thank you for joining us for tonight's talk by Emeritus Professor Geoffrey Blaney AC titled Byways and Highways of Ballarat's Long History. I'd like to begin by welcoming Professor Blaney and Mrs Anne Blaney, uh, an esteemed author in her own right, for being with us today. It's, um, and also, thank you for joining us. This is a really popular event, so you're lucky you got a ticket. You could, probably could have filled the mining exchange. So we might have a few more people drifting in, hopefully, because they've certainly got tickets. Uh, tonight, we gather on the land of the Wadarong people, and I pay my respects to elders past, present, and emerging, and extend that respect to all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people. We really value our relationship with the Wadarong people here at the Eureka Centre and appreciate their involvement in our programming, including tomorrow night's Hidden Histories at 6 p.m. And before I formally introduce Professor Blaney, a little bit of housekeeping. We've got a lot of people in the room, so if you could just turn your phones to silent. There's always someone that forgets, so I like to remind people. And um, at the end, I'll be fielding some questions. And once again, there's a lot of people here, so there may be a lot of questions. So if you could keep your questions brief, we'd really appreciate it. And if you could keep them as questions rather than really long comments, because that means we can squeeze more questions in. Okay, it's now my great honour to introduce Professor Blaney, who is one of Australia's most significant historians, authors and public intellectuals. His short history of the world, an international bestseller, can be read in many languages. His televised history of Australia, The Blaney View, was shown in 10 episodes on ABC television in the early 1980s. Professor Blaney was a student at Ballarat High School for, the, for three years from 1941 to 1943, and he often paddled his tin canoe on Lake Wendouree. And 50 years later, he was appointed the first Chancellor of Ballarat University, later called Federation University. The university's Geoffrey Blaney Research Centre is named in his honour. Professor Blaney was Professor of Economic History and then of History at the University of Melbourne, and he also held a chair at Harvard. He has been Chairman of National Institutions, including the Literature Board of the Australia Council, the National Council for the Centenary of Federation, and the Australia-China Council. In New York, along with celebrated economist J.K. Galbraith, he was awarded the Encyclopaedia Britannica's Gold Medal for Excellence in the Dissemination of Knowledge for the Benefit of Mankind. He's a well-known public speaker, and several of his speeches have been republished in the books in the series Great Australian Speeches. Please join me in welcoming Professor Blaney. <laughs> Uh, good evening. Uh, thank you very much for the generous introduction. I must say that uh, when I lived in Ballarat in the early 1940s, uh, there were no books available on Ballarat history. The books that had been written, but uh, they were no longer available. Uh, I, I learned nothing on the history of Ballarat when I was at school, but that would be true of anybody who went to any school in Victoria at that time about their own region. I learned a little from my grandfather, who was born in Millbrook, out near Wallace, in 1876. He lived uh, to old age, so that often he reminisced to me, but even in the early 1940s, he'd tell me things of interest. Have you, any of you read the book, The Diary of the Welsh Wagman? I imagine that's hard to get nowadays. In that book, uh, it, it refers to his family. They had a, an orchard at Millbrook, and they also had a jam factory. And the jam factory, they complained, was eventually vanquished by the imports of jam from Tasmania, which they claimed were largely pumpkin rather than strawberry and raspberry. <laughs> there was a strong sense of injustice in the world even in those days. Could I say just a little about the far past? 50,000 years ago, if you lived in Ballarat, and almost certainly there were people living in or near Ballarat, the world and Australia was completely different. If you were bold enough and you decided to explore, 
you could walk all the way to the southern end of Tasmania. That was settled sparsely by Aboriginals, as far as we know, 40 or 50,000 years ago. Indeed, southern Tasmania was the most southerly settlement in the whole world. There was no settlement in South America at that time. If you left Ballarat and you moved north, you could walk all the way, or almost, to the equator. There was no, there was no uh, Torres Strait. There was a big lake, Carpentaria Lake, which occupied much of the Gulf of Carpentaria. But you could walk to Port Moresby. You could probably walk to Rabaul, and you could almost certainly walk to within a degree or two of the equator. One of the great events in Australian history took place 17 or 18,000 years ago and came to a halt about 10,000 years ago. This was the separation of Australia from New Guinea. They were part of the same continent for most of the human history in this part of the world. New Guinea, of course, has very high country. We forget that New Guinea has Alps as high <coughs> as the tallest mountains in Europe. So that when at last the seas began to rise and gradually cut off Australia from New Guinea, something remarkable took place. Australia became the flattest continent on Earth. Here was a continent which previously had high mountains, but when the seas came up, we were left with only token mountains. If we'd had, in the centre of Australia, high mountains, or on the east coast, or the west coast, very high mountains, the climate of Australia would be very different, and you would have areas of permanent snow, or almost permanent snow, and when summers came and the snow melted, there would be great rivers flowing towards the sea. One of our great river systems, unfortunately, simply flows into Lake Eyre. If you were here 10,000 years ago, the map was completely altered. You could walk to North Queensland, the Torres Strait, stopped you walking any further. You could walk towards Tasmania, but Bass Strait stopped you completely. It was at that time, at that time, the Australian climate was completely changed. I think it's a pity that the International Committees on Climate Change uh, don't take an interest in history. They might come to the same conclusion, but it's a pity that we don't discuss how variable Australia's climate is over a long period of history. There's some remarkable research carried out in recent years at the University of Tasmania. A very talented woman named Tessa Vance and her team of researchers gained access to deep holes that were drilled in the Antarctic. In effect, the equivalent of a diamond drill hole was put down in the East Antarctic in an area that they called the Law Dome, named after Philip Law, who incidentally used to teach at Clunes in his younger days. And with the aid of the ice that's been carried up from that deep hole, you can learn so much about the climate of Australia in the last 2,000 years. One of the discoveries which has certainly astonished me is that Australia in the 12th century AD had a very, very dry period. The 12th century AD is about 100 years 
following the coming of William the Conqueror. It's about the time when Francis of Assisi lived in Italy. We now know that in 1174 AD, 1174 AD, there began in Australia a drought that lasted for 39 years. How people managed with a drought of that extent when already there'd been a long dry period, we don't know. There can be no doubt whatsoever that the population declined, the birth rate declined, the death rate increased. How far it declined, we don't know, but somebody will eventually try to work it out. So we live in a climate that has been variable for a long time, and I think this is one of the tributes you can make to the Aboriginal peoples that they survived during this long period of climate change and their minor periods of climate change and somehow kept their societies alive. The estimate is, and it can only be an estimate, that with the rising of the seas, 30% of Australia vanished and is still vanished out of sight. This creates problems for people intensely interested in Aboriginal history, because if you believe the souls, your soul when you die, goes back to the land of your ancestors, here's this big area, which is something of a puzzle. I'd like to say something about uh, various events in Ballarat's history. Sometimes they concern people. Uh, sometimes they concern a row of events. Could I just start with Governor Th Hotham? Nowadays, so many people in Ballarat know a lot about their history that there are several people in this room who probably know more than I know about Hotham. But one thing is very interesting. You've probably heard that the new King Charles says that he's going to investigate allegations that his ancestors were slave owners. At the moment in the world, there's enormous interest in slavery as a past institution, and people uh, quite rightly denounce it, but it's a very difficult institution to discuss. Before the welfare state existed, and it's a very recent creation of Australia and New Zealand, the creators, experimenters of the welfare state, before, before that happened, Slavery in many countries was beneficial. The Roman Empire built on slavery. Many people thought you were lucky to be a slave. In many ways, you were terribly unlucky, but you were looked after in old age. You were looked after in poor times. Of course, if you had a bad master and a bad mistress, that was a terrible blow. But if you read some of the early great people in the history of Christianity, they defend slavery as long as the slave is well looked after. Slavery, in, in many ways, quite rightly, is now very much out of fashion. By a strange turn of fate, now that slavery is back again in discussion, Charles Hotham has risen high in esteem. He was a naval officer, and in the late 1840s, he was in charge of a squadron of the British Navy based in West Africa and attempting to stop the slave trade, which was still flourishing, between Western Africa and especially Brazil, and to some degrees, a small degree, the United States. Hotham now has emerged, uh, we don't know too much about it in detail, but Hotham in charge of the squadron, anti-slavery squadron, of British naval vessels, captured 130 slave ships carrying on their business. He liberated about 11,000 slaves. Uh, it's very difficult to know 
what will happen to his reputation, whether suddenly it will rise, because his reputation tends to be fairly low. I think it's lower than it should be. He should never have been appointed to the post. He was a naval officer, a very experienced naval officer, appointed the governor of Victoria, appointed to look after Victoria at a time when an experimental democracy was beginning to emerge. And here was a man who believed, as all good naval officers did, in hierarchies, and at the top you made the decisions and accepted responsibility. Here he was confronting an experimental democratic society rising and with strong justification for its existence. It's a great pity, I think, that he was appointed uh, because in many ways he was very competent as a naval officer, but it's very difficult to be a naval officer and dictating at a time when people are saying, let's have self-government. He married just before he left for Australia early in 1854. He, I, I think this is, this is fair to say, he came out and he created a very favourable impression at first. He came to the gold fields and people respected him, not knowing what to expect, and gave him a great welcome. Being a military man, he also looked around him and said, this is great country for guerrilla warfare. And if there should be a revolution of any kind, the rebels have the great advantage of relatively wild country where they can constantly conceal themselves and then act surprises. In many ways, he was a very good military officer. But he came here and before long, the Eureka movement was underway and he was in trouble. Could I just say this? You may disagree. I think Lawler got himself into great difficulties, talent, talented as he was, when he and his men built the stockade and, in effect, declared rebellion against the government and gave the inhabitants and the residents of the stockade weekends leave. You can't really do that in a military situation. And uh, the soldiers and the police took advantage of it and stormed the stockade and captured it. In many ways, the military and the police acted with great skill and with brutality. But then Hotham lost the way and when public opinion began to turn and have sympathy for the miners and their grievances, he became more naval-like and more an authoritarian figure at a time when people were calling for some form of self-government. And so he lost his way. Incidentally, you can see why Hotham was appointed. Already there were signs in Europe of a serious war. The Crimean War was just breaking out with England, France and Turkey on one side, joined by the Kingdom of Piedmont in Italy, Turin as headquarters, and they fought in the Crimean Peninsula, now in the news every day, and they fought against the Russians. It was, in many ways, the most important war between nations between the end of the Napoleonic Wars in 1815 and the start of the First World War. The American Civil War, an, an internal war, was worse the Great Rebellion in China in the 1850s was worse, but in the wars between nations, the Crimean War was probably the most serious war in Europe. And the government must have thought, since Russia had a strong navy, we should have in that gold-rich land of Victoria somebody who knows how 
to defend it if by chance a Russian fleet arrived. Of course, the Crimean War was followed with intense interest in Ballarat. It was probably the first war in Europe where people actually went there as war correspondents or as spectators. They didn't go right into the battle, but they stood on the hills where the battles took place or where the fleets were being summoned. And uh, so many of the names of the Crimean War are with us today. Sebastopol, spelt with a B, isn't it? Now in the news. Rodan, Raglan, very much names from the Ukraine. Also Sananan. Sananan was the name of the great French soldier fighting in the Ukraine. And there are various other names. If you go down to some Melbourne suburbs, Balaclava, the well-known suburb, Balaclava is, of course, a famous battle in the crime world in the early 1850s. So that's a, it, it is, that, that is, I think, I could be wrong, part of the explanation why a man really unsuited to be a governor in such a different situation, so different to La Trobe, who was a gentle... Christian soul, to be given that responsibility at that time proves to be quite wrong, but you can understand the British government wanting to protect this great source of gold. Not only was Victoria a great supplier of gold at a time when gold was the backing of currency in the Western world, but Victoria was a huge importer of goods from Britain in the 1850s. And the big section of the British economy depended on goods bought from Britain and sold on the goldfields of Victoria and the smaller goldfields of New South Wales. So in the end, uh, and it was a sad ending for Hotham, uh, he resigned or he gave notice of his resignation he lived in Melbourne in a house which is now the Swedish church in Turak. Uh, stayed up very late at night doing everything himself in the naval fashion and uh, he died quite suddenly, I think on the last day of the year, just 12 months after the Eureka Stockade. I don't know what happened to his wife. He married just before he left England to become the governor of Victoria. Somebody here must know what happened to his wife. She was the daughter of the Lord, and presumably she went back to England and possibly remarried. Could I move on to other events? I've picked out certain events that I think are of considerable interest. One that interests me is named John Watsford. Has anybody heard of John Watsford? He was famous in Ballarat at one period, and he took part in a remarkable Sunday, which I'll tell you about. He was born in Parramatta in 1820. His father was a convict. He came out as a horse thief, stealing a horse in those days was a serious offence, the horse being so essential in so many occupations. He was lucky that he wasn't sentenced to death, but he came out to Sydney as a convict, uh, eventually served his time. I think he had a family of 14, and nearly all of them lived. Uh, John Watsford was very evangelical when young. I don't know whether it came from the mother well, the father, he went to the famous King School in Parramatta, not yet famous. He then became desirous of becoming a clergyman, and he became a Methodist clergyman, the first Australian-born Methodist clergyman there was. There was no one really to teach him, and although he was effectively ordained, he was self-taught. 
He went to Fiji in the 1840s and then went back again in the early 1850s and he had the major part in translating the New Testament into Fijian. Fijian, of course, is still very much a Christian country and uh, without doubt it's still more Christian than any country in Europe with the possible exception of Poland. He came back to Australia and settled in Victoria and became a successful preacher because he was a magnetic speaker. He came to Ballarat, I think in 18, the early 1860s and preached at the Lydiard Street Church not far from here. He had such a big following that when he left Ballarat and went to what was then a flourishing church in Brunswick Street, Fitzroy, near the Housing Commission. When he went there, large numbers of people from Ballarat, if they ever holidayed in Melbourne, went to hear him preach, irrespective of their denomination, except, of course, if they were Catholics. <laughs> he became the best-known Methodist in Australia. And when in 1881, the Methodist Church worldwide, if there was such a church worldwide, held their first international conference in London. He was selected as a delegate for Australia and New Zealand. This to me is a remarkable thing. I don't think he'd been to Europe before, but it was a great adventure. And he went by ship. In those days, in 1881, the Suez Canal was becoming busier and busier. They were widening it so ships could squeeze through as long as they weren't too large. The practice was if you were going from Australia to England and you had money, you went in the ship through the Suez Canal and then when the ship reached the south of Italy, Brindisi as the Italians call it, I think we call it Brindisi, Brindisi, he left the ship as the custom was and went by train to England. You saved about two or three days because the ship, after it left, Brenda Z called, I think, at Malta or Gibraltar or Naples and was very slow in reaching London. He caught the train at Brenda Z, went up to um, Milan and then went uh, on that tunnel through the Alps that link Zurich and Milan. And he reached the border of Switzerland and Italy on Sunday. He didn't believe in travelling on Sunday. That was very common amongst many people in those days. You couldn't stop the ship, but if you were on land, you could get off the train. So he left the train on Saturday night. And next morning, he went to the station again and said, is there a Protestant church in this town? They said, of course, and it's flourishing. He went to the Protestant church in time for the morning service, and they must have announced that there was a visitor from Australia come to join them just for the day. And he was astonished at all the people who came up and said, I heard you preach at Newstead, or I heard you do this somewhere else. Well, you married my cousin. And here were all these people coming up who had migrated to Yandois and Ballarat and Bendigo and Malden and Ararat with their strong connection to Australia and loving to renew it. Some of them said it was a sad day when I decided, or my wife decided, to return back to Italy or Switzerland. But it's a very interesting, very interesting comment on the migration that went to and fro. We imagine in the gold rushes people coming to Bendigo and Ballarat and staying here, staying here until they died, or perhaps going to another Australian mining field. But we forget that there were people all the time wanting to go home. And if they were successful, they tended to go home. Where 
the leftovers were the children <laughs> of, of the unsuccessful. <laughs> you can understand why many of them wanted to get home and you can understand why others were reluctant to go home. They didn't have the fare, but the voyage was so difficult. You know, if you wanted to leave Ballarat, if you made money and you decided to go home, or perhaps you went home to get some brothers or to get a wife, when you decided to go home, you caught a ship at Port Melbourne and the ship didn't go towards the Suez Canal, the sailing ship couldn't go through the Suez Canal. The ship, and even the new steamships on the Liverpool-Melbourne reef, they left the port of Melbourne, sailed to the south of New Zealand, came very close to the Auckland Islands, way out in the Pacific Ocean, then came close to Cape Horn, no port of call. When they came near Cape Horn, they knew that there could be icebergs, and many of them would stay up all night hoping to see an iceberg. Occasionally, unfortunately, their wish was granted. <laughs> the ship then called nowhere, no port. It crossed the, it crossed the uh, equator, the winds being unfavorable, very slowly across the equator, and then it moved on, usually to Liverpool or to a port in southern England. Only about 65 or 70 days for the very far ships to make it, but a very rough and uncomfortable voyage. One thing I should say, most of you know this, that Ballarat was very wealthy and it imported ice. In the late 1850s, Ballarat was a great consumer of ice which came from Boston. It was from ponds frozen in the winter, the ice was dug up and buried. And when the summer came, the ice had a high market value. Ships bound for Australia would call at Boston and load with ice, a cargo of nothing but ice, occasionally apples or some fruit in a, in a crate, but otherwise a cargo of nothing but ice. A lot of melting took place in the equator. Eventually the ship reached Port Phillip Bay Immediately, if there was no railway to Ballarat, and the railway didn't reach Ballarat, it was in 1862, if there was no railway to Ballarat, it was placed in Cobb & Co, or another fast horse-drawn vehicle, and sent up to Ballarat. In Ballarat, then it was exp very expensive and used much more for making puddings in summer than for putting on the spirits or curling the wine. In Ballarat, they were so choosy about their ice that they would ask, where did the ice come from? <laughs> Which pond in Boston did it come from? <laughs> and occasionally you see old advertisements for Ballarat which says that a certain ice is now available in Ballarat. It would only be available for a couple of days. Geelong was a great competitor. A Geelong inventor in, invented artificial ice. He was a newspaper proprietor, a man named Harrison, very bright, and he invented the making of artificial ice. For many years, he didn't make much headway in Ballarat. They said the Geelong ice wasn't cold enough. <laughs> <laughs> I must finish with a comment on Watsford. Uh, Watsford uh, had a grandson, his name was Doug Watsford. I think he learned to be a vet, but in the period where large numbers of people from the Ballarat district were going to Western Australia, he went to Western Australia, played football for Coolgardie, Coolgardie and Kalgoorlie, had great Victorian football, was in the 1890s, and he played for Coolgardie. Then he went and played for Fremantle, and then he came back to Gippsland and played for a poor Gippsland team, and then he went to Collingwood. And he played only 21 games for Collingwood in about the year 1900. And many people said he was the best player who'd ever come to Collingwood. Such a high mark. 
Such a long kick. Such a straight kick. I don't know what you'd say now, but I suspect that he's more famous than his grandfather. <laughs> Unfortunately, he got some sickness and went, why, I don't know, to Wagga Wagga for a cure. Uh, he died eventually, just before the start of the First World War. I must say something about Bella Guerin. Is she famous in Ballarat? How many people know of Bella Guerin? Yeah, she's not yet famous. <laughs> she was. Bella Guerin was uh, the, the daughter of a public servant who looked after criminals. She was born at Williamstown in 1858, seven years after the discovery of gold. Her father eventually became the governor of the Ballarat Jail, then one of the most important jails in Victoria, and of course, much of it still standing. Bella Guerin was very bright and studied hard and went to the Melbourne University. And in 1883, was the first woman to graduate from a university in Australia. I think there was no female graduate from Oxford or Cambridge at that time. She uh, must have had a very good mind, a rebellious mind, which made her, I think, all the better as a teacher. She became a teacher in Ballarat. She taught at Loretto. I think the Loretto nuns came to Ballarat about 1875 and had a great impact on education in this part of the world. She taught for a time at Loretto. Then she taught at a school called Grenville College, which I'll say something about later. She taught my wife, who's here tonight, my wife Anne's grandmother. In fact, when we were married, we lived with the grandmother for quite some months. And the grandmother was a student of Bella Guerin. She went to Bella Grenville College as a boarder down near the Creswick Road and wanted to do some difficult subjects. And they said, the only person who can teach them in Ballarat is Bella Guerin. She was then teaching at the School of Mines. And uh, Anne's grandmother went to the School of Mines and met this magnetic teacher. And she used to tell my wife in old age, what a wonderful teacher Bella Guerin was. Bella Guerin taught in various schools and became famous as a militant. One of the leading feminists, you realize in the history of women, Australia and New Zealand played a very important part. New Zealand in in the mid-1890s, was the first country in the world to give women the vote, but it didn't give them the right to stand for parliament. But it was the Australian Federal Parliament, very early in its existence, in 1902, not only gave the women in Australia the right to vote, but the right to stand for parliament. Curiously, it was a very long time before that was made use of. And I think the first female parliamentarian in Australia was a Western Australian who entered the West Australian, I think, upper house in the early 1920s. The first woman in Victoria, I'm pretty sure, to become a member of parliament was Lady Peacock who stood for the seat of Clunes Allendale. Imagine Allendale being the name of an electorate. <laughs> this was in the mid-1930s. Her husband, Sir Alexander Peacock, no relation, or if so, a distant relation of Andrew Peacock, who died recently and was Australia's foreign minister at one time. But uh, 
when he died, uh, she stood for the seat and was unopposed. It was often a great tribute that people would often pay in those days, not to oppose somebody they honoured. It's not very much done these days. <laughs> Bella Guerin, uh, Bella Guerin became very powerful in the vote for women campaigns, very strong in the anti-conscription campaign in 1916, 1917, when Australia was very much divided on the question of whether Australian young men be, should be conscripted to fight in Europe or whether the Australian army should remain a purely voluntary army. She ended her life in Adelaide. She died in Adelaide with no great age in 1923. I suspect one day there will be a move to erect a statue in Sturt Street. Maybe one has been put up there in the last few years and I haven't noticed it. But there will probably be some move to have a woman. I think Queen Victoria is in Sturt Street, isn't she? Or Sturt Street is the most famous street of statues in Australia. I don't think there can be any, any doubt about it. It's remarkable that the town so young should decide that people of significance should be honoured. And I suspect that one day people will say, who are the great women in Ballarat's history? And I think Bella Guerin, for her significance alone, would probably be the one. It was 1883 that Bella Guerin received in Wilson Hall, the old Wilson Hall in the University of Melbourne, her degree from the Chancellor, all the illustrated papers, there were no photographs then, all the illustrated papers had a picture of her, rather a fine looking face, quite tall, because people thought how remarkable a woman could go to a university and actually take out a degree. In the same year, there was a remarkable event at Ballarat. People who are interested in football history may know something about it. Uh, football was very strong in Ballarat. Uh, I suspect that the proportion of the population who would attend a big football match in Ballarat in the 1870s and 80s was higher than the proportion in Melbourne who would attend a big football match. A match was played in September 1883 at the Western Oval between the Ballarat Imperials and another team called the Imperials. I forget, that was at the Albion Imperials. Very royalist name, isn't it, to have fo football teams. The, the captain of the Ballarat Imperials was named John Mills. He was aged 27, a very skillful footballer, fairly tall, I suspect. And on this particular Saturday afternoon, he flew for a mark. The high mark then wasn't very common. It was considered rather dangerous. And in fact, the main football books of the 1870s said, don't attempt a high mark. It's very dangerous. The Ballarat Courier had strong views and it said play, players should stick to their positions exactly and not go out of their way to make a high mark. John Mills flew up with the pack and came down and either fell on somebody's knees or somebody may have accidentally kicked him. He was in a bad way, he went home. His parents lived on Soldier's Hill and he felt, I must watch the time. He, he felt uh, miserable. On Monday morning he thought, maybe if I have a bath, in, in the public baths, I'll feel better. And he caught a horse-drawn cab and on his way to the city baths, I think that was probably the baths in Armstrong Street, am I right? And fell dead. The shock, shock, the shock in Ballarat was immense. He was a favourite football player and a good citizen. His funeral took place 
I think, of the new cemetery. And he was so popular that it was near to the graveside as they could gather where 4,000 to 5,000 spectators there to honour him. The family were Baptists at the Baptist Church, not far from St. Patrick's Cathedral. So the preacher gave a sermon. They said it was a, a wonderful sermon. You wonder how people could be heard in the open air long before there was a microphone. But the good preachers knew how to propel their voice so that people could hear them at a great distance. I think that was about one out of every seven or eight people in Ballarat who were at the funeral, and I assume a higher proportion would have been male rather than female, although Australian rules by then was famous in football standards by the largest numbers of women who were spectators. In England, even today, if you go to a big soccer match, the women are not there in large numbers. The Ballarat Courier repeated its call and said players should stick to their positions. We've had enough of these dangerous high marks. It's sad that Ballarat didn't go into the major football league. I think the big problem for Ballarat was it was too far from Melbourne in the period of travel. Geelong could manage because there was a cheap steamer which would carry spectators down to Geelong and there was the railway line from an early period. <coughs> Whereas there, in the 1850s, in the 60s and 70s, if you wanted to go to Ballarat by train, you first came to Geelong and then you went up to Ballarat. So uh, it was too slow and too long. But you get some idea of the standard of football in Ballarat. In 1897, the Victorian Football League, the, the, the predecessor of the present AFL, was formed, and I think it must have been on King's birthday, 1897, a team of league players played against a team of Ballarat players. And Ballarat won, I think, 14-11 to 8-6, which gives you some idea of what the standard of football was like in Ballarat then. And I suspect that Ballarat then was in a period of slump because so many good Ballarat footballers were playing in Western Australia. Arthur Lynch. Could I just have a word about Arthur Lynch? Has anybody heard of Arthur Lynch? Yeah. Thank, thanks very much. He'd, <laughs> he'd be pleased to be here tonight. Uh, Arthur Lynch came from Smilesdale. Uh, his father was at the stockade. He, they, he was called one of the captains who led a small group under Peter Lawler. Uh, he, he had a large family. I think he also, I think the family also numbered 14. Arthur Lynch uh, was very, very bright. There can be no doubt about it. Some people said he was close to the brightest man in the world in his heyday. Not that he was an expert beyond anybody else in any particular facet, but in so many fields, he knew more than almost anybody else. It's a sign that sectarianism wasn't too strong in Ballarat, that he went uh, to Ballarat College, which was a Presbyterian school, I'm not sure how long he was there, and then he went to Grenville College, which was not owned by the Methodist Church, but was very much a Methodist school. He, uh, he then went to Melbourne University and became a Bachelor of Civil Engineering and then also, unusual at that time, did an arts degree. He wanted to leave Australia, he never returned. And he went to Berlin and learned German, married an Irish girl living in Berlin, became a distinguished newspaper correspondent, studied all kinds of subjects and people amazed at his knowledge. And then when the Boer War was being fought, he went to South Africa. And although a British citizen, 
he decided to help the Boers, and he formed a tiny little half army, many of them British citizens, and fought for the Boers against the British. He then went back to Europe and uh, was slightly surprised when he was arrested on a charge of treason. <laughs> he said they didn't do that in Smilesdale. <laughs> so he was sentenced to death. Uh, the sentence was slightly commuted, but he spent time in prison from 1902. He was finally exonerated in 1907 when he became a member of the House of Commons. He was famous also because <laughs> it was famous also because he didn't believe in Einstein. He said Einstein's main theory was wrong. This was before they had that huge assemblage of scientists about 1922 on the coast of Western Australia, somewhere near Port Hedland, and largely proved that Einstein was right. He died in 1934. It's interesting, Sir Robert Menzies is now, I think, the most famous old boy of Grenville College. He went to the Humphrey, he went to school in Japan, then he went to the Humphrey Street State School, and then he got a government scholarship to Grenville College, which was a small school for boys and, and for girls, and uh, eventually became the most famous old boy. And it was curious to think that Mr. Menzies, being conservative in many ways, Mr. Menzies should replace Arthur Lynch as the most famous old boy, given the radical Republican background of Arthur Lynch. Mr. Menzies, by the way, though that has a lot to do with feminism, Mr. Menzies, so often seen as a conservative, made one of the remarkable decisions in democratic politics when he formed the Liberal Party at a time when he was in the wilderness himself, in 1944 and 1945, he insisted in Victoria that every pre-selection committee should have as many women as men. And that was probably the first major political party in the Western world which gave such a high standing to women. I must complete. I think there should be a statue to W.G. Spence. He was from the Orkney Islands in Scotland, came out with his parents to dig for gold. His hometown was Smoky Town. Some of you have gone on the road towards Newstead past the sign, beware of Smoky Town or whatever it says. He lived in Smoky Town. He became an ardent trade unionist because there were so many gold mines around Smeaton and Allendale. He formed a miners' union, the Amalgamated Miners' Association, in the 1880s, which was very successful. The president, for a brief time, was the grandfather, the Cornish grandfather of Sir Robert Menzies. Menzies had a very mixed heritage politically. He then became very prominent in Ballarat founding the Shearers Union. And Ballarat became the home of what eventually became the Australian Workers Union, that huge union. He entered the New South Wales Parliament as member for Cobar, way out west, and was member in the New South Wales Parliament in the early period of the Labour Party from 1898 to 1901. Then he entered the Federal Parliament and had a seat there until 1917, when a Labour hero, he decided that people should be conscripted. And he and Billy Hughes and large numbers of members of the Labour Party decided to leave the Labour Party just before they were expelled <laughs> and form an independent party and under Billy Hughes. They, they governed Australia. But uh, Spence is such a significant figure in Australian history. I think the miners and shearers unions, for those who are interested in the history of trade unions, were amongst the remarkable 
trade unions in the history of the whole world of trade unionism. It was usually easy for trade unions to flourish in the cities where you could summon the people with ease or on the wharves. But to do them in outback industries and to summon them and to form them into a powerful force is a remarkable thing to do. I suspect one day there will be a statue in honour of W.G. Spence and people of both sides of politics, because he belonged to both sides of politics, will eventually respect him. I must conclude. I'd like to say something, but I won't. <laughs> Time is up about Ernest Coates, uh, Albert Coates. I think he was a remarkable man. One of the... Uh, from, from um, Mount Pleasant, uh, studied at night school, uh, went to Wangaratta as a postman, uh, enlisted in the First World War as a stretcher bearer, a very dangerous job in the First World War, came back from the war and studied medicine while working as a postal clerk at night, took out his medical degree and became one of the great surgeons in Melbourne. And in 1942, when the Japanese army, in one of the, you have to call it now, one of the brilliant feats in military history, swept through Southeast Asia in no time, he was in Singapore and he had the opportunity to catch a plane and come back to Australia. He said, no, I'll stay there. He became a prisoner of war. And while where he done not rightly, is famous for the way he stood up to the Japanese. Albert Coates was the, was the great surgeon there, and so many people owed their lives to his work, especially to his skillful amputations with homemade implements. I was asked to speak at the unveiling of his statue in Sturt Street. It was at about 2000, and they preceded it with a religious service in the Mount Pleasant Methodist Church, of, of which he and his parents belonged and it really, really was so moving to see survivors from the prisoner of war camps, some of them with visible signs of amputations, all there to pay tribute to Albert Coates before his statue in Sturt Street was unveiled. Thank you very much. Thank you.